Help me. Amen. For the past couple of months, we've been going through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and we've been going through it section by section. Today, we're talking about Jesus' teaching on divorce. Now, this is a difficult issue to deal with because it is often an emotionally charged issue, especially for those whose lives have been affected by divorce, which is most of us. If we've not been through it ourselves, we have a friend or a family member who's been through a divorce. And so this, this is a very emotional issue for many of us. In the interest of full disclosure, I want you to know, in case you don't already know, that I myself have been through a divorce. I was divorced from my first wife in 2002. And it was the most wretched, painful thing that I have yet experienced in my life. Now, as you might imagine, when I was going through that nightmare, I studied what the Bible teaches about divorce very thoroughly. I must admit that if I hadn't been going through a divorce myself, it's likely that I would not have studied that issue as vigorously as I did. In my study, I learned a lot of things that I didn't previously know. And it greatly affected the way that I view that issue of divorce. Today, I'm going to share with you some of what I learned. I ask that you please listen carefully all the way to the end of the sermon. If at some point I say something that you don't agree with, please don't just tune me out. I don't ask that you agree with me. But I do ask that you at least give a fair hearing to what I have to say. And what that means is listening all the way through to the end. Because if you only catch part of this, separated from the full context, you are likely to misunderstand what I'm going to try to say today. So hang with me. The, uh, the passage that we're focusing on is part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, if you would please turn there. It's page 684 in those Bibles provided in the pews. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, again continuing with the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in verse 30, Jesus says this, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Now, what might be called the plain reading of this passage seems pretty clear, doesn't it? Jesus appears to be saying that any divorce is invalid in the eyes of God unless one spouse has been sexually unfaithful to the other. It appears that unless marital unfaithfulness has occurred, any divorce and remarriage is seen by God as adulterous and therefore sinful in the eyes of God. Is that what Jesus meant? If this were the only passage in the Bible about divorce or the only teaching Jesus gave on divorce, then I would have to agree, yeah, it's pretty clear. That's what Jesus meant. But if we want to know what God really thinks about divorce, then we must be careful to read all that the Bible has to say about it and to not just read one or two passages and then ignore the rest. In fact, in the verses that we just read, Jesus himself points us to another biblical passage. In verse 31, when he says, It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. When he says that, he is referring to Deuteronomy 
Now, the Jewish religious teachers of Jesus' day, the rabbis, they debated greatly about what Deuteronomy 24.1 actually meant. Deuteronomy 24.1 says this, If a man marries a woman, but she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something improper about her, he may write her a divorce certificate, hand it to her, and send her away from his house. So this verse allowed a husband to divorce his wife if he found something improper. Or as several other translations put it, something indecent. Well, what's that supposed to mean? That is the question about which the rabbis debated, the meaning of that word improper or indecent. What is that supposed to mean? Now, about a generation or so before Jesus... Two prominent rabbis, Hillel and Shammai, strongly disagreed about how to interpret Deuteronomy 24.1. Hillel taught that something improper or indecent meant anything that displeased the husband. Anything that displeased the husband. So Hillel taught that a man could legitimately divorce his wife if she was a bad cook, if she burned his food, seriously, or if she was no longer physically attractive enough to suit him, that for any reason he could divorce his wife. Now, by the way, in ancient Jewish culture, only a man could file for divorce. Women were not allowed to do so on their own. Now, they could have another man, a brother or an uncle or a father, stand up for them on their behalf. But the husband was the one that had to file for divorce. So that's why this language keeps reflecting that. So Hillel and his followers, known as the Hillelites, in their rabbinical courts granted men what came to be known as any reason divorces. They said that you could get divorced for basically any reason. It, uh, similar to the so-called no-fault divorces in our society. Just, hey, you don't want to be married anymore? Okay, that's fine. We'll grant you a divorce. But the rabbi Shammai disagreed with this. He argued that in Deuteronomy 24.1, that phrase, something indecent, referred only to sexual unfaithfulness or adultery. So he and his followers, the Shamites, would grant divorces in their rabbinical courts only if there was evidence of adultery or some other serious offense, as we shall see in just a moment. So, if you were living in first century Palestine and you wanted to divorce your spouse, if you went to a Shamite rabbinical court, then you had to provide evidence of serious offenses in order to have that divorce granted. But, if you went to a Hillelite court, all you had to say was, you didn't want to be married anymore. And they would grant you a divorce. Now, as you might imagine, most men that got divorces in that society got them in Hillelite courts. It was a whole lot easier and a lot less messy. You didn't have to provide evidence in their courts as to some sort of justification for why you wanted to be divorced. You could just get divorced for any reason. So, with all this in mind that I just explained, let's read that again. Jesus says that in Matthew chapter 5. I hope you're still there. Let's read that passage again knowing what we know now. Verse 31, Matthew 5, 31, Jesus said, It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Again, he's quoting Deuteronomy 24, 1. But I tell you, 
that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress. And anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. So, Jesus sided with the Shamite interpretation of Deuteronomy 24.1. Jesus apparently agreed with them that the phrase something improper or something indecent referred to sexual unfaithfulness. Jesus was basically saying that if you got one of those any reason divorces, then it was not a valid divorce in the eyes of God. As the first note on the note sheet says, provided there in the bulletins, to divorce someone without a legitimate reason in God's eyes and then remarry someone else is to practice adultery. Those Hillelite rabbinical courts would declare that couple divorced. But that didn't mean God saw it in the same way. Our courts today will declare a couple divorced, but that doesn't mean that that divorce is, has legitimate grounds in God's eyes. It may have legitimate grounds in the eyes of the state, but that doesn't mean it has legitimate grounds in the eyes of God. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this passage in Matthew 5 is not the only passage where Jesus talks about divorce. As a matter of fact, the lengthiest conversation that Jesus has about divorce is found later in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 19. So if you would please turn there with me. Matthew 19, that's page 696. The Bible's in the pews. Matthew 19. In Matthew 19, beginning in verse 3, we read, Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Catch that? The Pharisees were asking Jesus to weigh in on their debate about the true meaning of Deuteronomy 24.1. And, and really, you know, it says they came to test him or to trap him, some translations put it. This is one of those hot-button issues, one of those theological debates in their culture where no matter how you answer it, you're going to wind up being opposed to somebody. It's going to put you at odds with somebody. So they're trying to set him up so that he'll lose credibility in somebody's eyes. So they're asking him to weigh in on this debate. But before Jesus answers their question, he reminds them, of God's original intention for marriage. So continue there at verse 4. Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. In just a few short sentences, Jesus reminds us that God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman for a lifetime between one man and one woman for a lifetime. According to Jesus, that's what marriage is supposed to be. Continuing there in Matthew 19, verse 7, the Pharisees counter. They say, Why then, they ask, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, not commanded. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife 
except for marital unfaithfulness and marries another woman, commits adultery. Jesus explains that Moses allowed people to divorce because their hearts were hard. He then makes it clear that Deuteronomy 24.1 should be interpreted to refer to marital unfaithfulness. And by the way, the Greek word here, and also in Matthew 5, that is translated as marital unfaithfulness, is the Greek word pornia, where we get the word pornography. And that word pornia didn't just mean adultery, it meant sexual immorality in general. So Jesus is talking about, you know, that Deuteronomy 24, 1, that something improper, something indecent, refers to sexual immorality of whatever kind. So Jesus agreed with the Shamites that Deuteronomy 24, 1 allows a man to divorce his wife if she's been sexually immoral. Jesus clearly does not agree that a person should divorce his or her spouse for any and every reason. Now, Deuteronomy 24.1 was not the only Old Testament passage that the rabbis quoted in regard to divorce. We'll talk a little bit about the, how the rabbis approached uh, the issue of divorce by looking at the Old Testament. And in case you're wondering, well, how do we know this? How do we know what the rabbis said and what they did and what they were debating about? Uh, I'm getting this information from a marvelous book that I believe it was uh, first published in 2002, written by a scholar named David N. Stone Brewer. It's called Divorce and Remarriage in the Bible, the Social and Literary Context. It's a great book. And what he did, what N. Stone Brewer did, is he went back and he researched the ancient rabbinical texts that have survived, and he, he went through there to try and reconstruct what were the rabbis saying? How did they interpret the Old Testament? What, was, what were the discussions about divorce that were swirling around during the time of Jesus? So that we could put Jesus' statements in their proper historical context. The, the people of that culture and time, what did they automatically assume when it came to divorce? What, what, did they, what was the conventional wisdom based on the Old Testament scripture. So that's what Instone Brewer did. He went back and read these. We do have uh, records of rabbinical debates and even uh, rabbinical court cases. He goes back and looks at this. And in the years since the release of that book in 2002, uh, a lot of other scholars have looked at his work and they've affirmed the quality of his scholarship. And so that's where this is coming from, is these ancient rabbinical texts that have survived from that time period. What Instone Brewer found and what other scholars have corroborated as they've checked his work is that Deuteronomy 24.1 was not the only text that these rabbis went to when they wanted to understand what is God's will concerning divorce. They also cited a passage in Exodus 21 as providing acceptable grounds for a divorce. Now that passage had to do with a situation where a man married a woman who up until their marriage had been a slave. How, are, how is she supposed to be treated? Exodus 21 verses 10 and 11 says this. If he marries another woman that's in addition to the woman, the first woman that used to be a slave, he marries another woman in addition to her, he must not deprive the first one of her food, clothing, and marital rights. If he does not provide her with these three things, she is to go free without any payment of money. And what that phrase means, without any payment of money, means it doesn't matter if she used to be a slave. She doesn't have to buy her freedom now. She has the full rights of a free person, of a free woman. But if her husband didn't provide her with food, clothing, or marital rights, then she was free to leave. And what the rabbis did is they looked at this and they said, if these are the rights that God gives a woman who had been a slave then surely these rights are also accorded to a woman who had always been a free person. And if these are the rights that God gives women in a marriage, then certainly God would give these rights to men too. So what they did is they said, well, well there are legitimate grounds for divorce if, if a spouse is being deprived of food, clothing, or marital rights. Now, 
some rabbis taught, you know, that, that, that word, uh, that phrase marital rights. What did that mean? Food, clothing, that's pretty clear. You know, don't deprive your spouse of food or clothing. But marital rights, what does that mean? Some rabbis taught that marital rights specifically meant sex. While others taught that marital rights included sex, but more generally meant love or kindness. So in Exodus 21, 10 and 11, the rabbis understood that if a spouse deprived the other of food, clothing, or marital rights, that is, if a spouse neglected or abused their spouse, neglect, depriving them of necessities of life, food and clothing, uh, abuse, depriving them of marital rights, of love, then this neglect or abuse would serve as legitimate grounds for divorce. Now, I should also point out that the rabbis thought that neglect and abuse were legitimate grounds for divorce only if the neglect or abuse was persistent and unrepentant over a long period of time. So we're not talking about an isolated incident of neglect or abuse. We're referring to neglect or abuse as a lifestyle over a long period of time. Interestingly, Jesus did not refer to this passage in Exodus when he discussed divorce with the Pharisees. Now many scholars, not just in Stone Brewer, but many scholars believe that Jesus didn't bring it up because he agreed with their interpretation of that verse and therefore, therefore saw no need to bring it up. They say this because throughout the Gospels, Jesus repeatedly brought up his areas of disagreement with the Pharisees. He didn't seem hesitant, hesitant at all to let them know when he disagreed with how they were interpreting Scripture. And they had discussions about divorce. And in those discussions, Jesus clearly seems to be pointing to Deuteronomy 24.1, but he doesn't bring up the Exodus 21 passage at all. So many scholars say that that sure implies that he didn't have a problem with how they were interpreting that passage or applying it. Also, the Apostle Paul appears to base some of his teaching about the responsibilities of marriage on that passage from Exodus 21. For example, in regard to not depriving your spouse of marital rights, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Apostle Paul wrote this, the husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs. And it more literally, in the Greek says, should fulfill his marital duty. So he should fulfill his wife's sexual needs, and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband. And the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. So there he's affirming that do not deprive each other of marital rights, and he specifies it there to sex. And later in that same chapter in 1 Corinthians 7, later on he's writing about a situation in which you have a Christian who's married to a non-Christian. And Paul writes that the Christian should not divorce the non-Christian if the non-Christian is still willing to live with the person who has now become a follower of Jesus. But then Paul writes this. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 7.15. But if the husband or wife who isn't a believer insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the Christian husband or wife is no longer bound to the other. For God has called you to live in peace. In this verse, most Christians see that Paul establishes abandonment as legitimate grounds for divorce. Yet in doing so, Paul is being consistent with the typical rabbinical understanding of that passage in Exodus 21. 
After all, if your spouse abandons you, then they are certainly not going to be providing you with food, clothing, or marital rights. Abandonment is, of course, an extreme form of neglect. So, to sum up all of what we've learned so far, God wants marriage to last a lifetime. But since our hearts are hard, that is, since we are sinful people living in a sinful world, God does allow divorce in certain extreme circumstances. And as just explained, the biblical grounds for divorce are sexual immorality, neglect, abuse, and abandonment. Sexual immorality, neglect, abuse, and abandonment. Now, I want to be clear that not all, not all Christians agree on this. There has been and there continues to be a lot of debate over what the legitimate biblical grounds for divorce are. There are even branches of Christianity that teach that divorce should never be allowed no matter what the situation is. But what I am presenting to you this morning is what I believe to be the most biblical view. If you look at the Bible as a whole, if you consider the historical context, if you want me to stay in this difficult situation, in this marriage, I'll do it. Can, have you been able to come to that place where you say, yes, Lord, I am, I am yours, whatever you are. God hates divorce. Divorce must not be entered into lightly. If you're considering divorcing your spouse, can you honestly stand before God and say that you do have biblical grounds? Now, it's easy to convince ourselves that something is true when it's not. All of us have a tendency to believe what we want to believe. So we've got to be careful here, folks. You may be able to convince your friends that you have legitimate grounds for divorce. You may be able to convince yourself. But can you convince God? And God's not fooled. God is able to see our deepest motives with absolute clarity even when we have lost sight of our own motives ourselves. Can you stand before God and confidently say, yes, I do have biblical grounds. If you're considering filing for divorce, are you really at peace with God in regard to what you're about to do? Now, it may be that your spouse has left you and that they're the one who's filing for divorce, they're the one who's, who's pushing things through. And you're trying, you're trying to reach out, and it's just, it's just not working. Well, as the Apostle Paul said, we saw it in 1 Corinthians 7, if that's the case, let them go. Let them go. You can't control them. You can't, <laughs> I know, <laughs> you can't force someone else to stay. You can't force someone else to love you. And, not, and God does not hold you responsible for their choices. But God does hold you responsible for your choices. So the question is, even though Paul says you're not bound in such a situation, if they're going to go, they're going to go. You know, let them go. But however, whether or not your spouse is honoring God, the question is, are you honoring God? That's the question. Because you can't control them, but you can control you. Am I being the spouse God wants me to be no matter what they're doing? Can you say that, yes, I am. I'm doing all I can do. We are sinful people living in a sinful world. Because of sin, sometimes a husband or a wife can find themselves in a marriage that is unlivable. Therefore, God does allow divorce in certain extreme circumstances. 
But that's not what marriage is supposed to be. God designed marriage to be between one, woman, one man and one woman for a lifetime. According to Jesus, we saw it in Matthew 19, that's what marriage is supposed to be. And if both spouses will seek God and love Him with all their hearts, the Holy Spirit within them will empower them to have a healthy, loving marriage that lasts a lifetime. I don't care what kind of trouble or difficulty or hurt or pain or dysfunction has happened in a marriage. If both spouses will come to the place where they completely surrender themselves to Jesus as Lord and say, we're going to follow your way no matter what, God will empower them to do whatever they need to do over however long it takes to find the healing. Remember, divorce occurs because at least one spouse just stopped following God. Perhaps you've been listening to all of this. And you're thinking, I, I need to say something here before we wrap up. We're about to wrap up. But before I say this, before I wrap up, perhaps you've been listening to all of this and you've been thinking, but I've already been through a divorce. I can't go back. I can't change what's happened. So what does that mean for me now? Am I damaged goods? Does that mean that God can never use me again in the way that he could have used me in the past? Does that mean that God will always see this stain on me no matter what? Next week is Baptist Women's Day. But two weeks from today, I'm going to teach part two of this sermon on divorce. And the next part will be directed primarily toward those of us who have been through divorce. What does it mean for us now? All I'll say right now is that God has love and grace even for divorced people. There is hope. So in two weeks, we'll talk about this. Especially, guys, if you have friends that have been through a divorce or are going through a divorce and they're in the teeth of that pain, I encourage you, please invite them. Invite them anytime, but especially two weeks from today, okay? If you are married, are you being the spouse that God wants you to be? Whether or not your spouse is honoring God, you can. You can honor God. God will always empower you and me to obey Him. Whether or not our spouse is obeying Him, you can obey Him. You can honor Him. We can honor Him. We can be the spouses God wants us to be. That is within our power, even though what they do is not within our power. I'm not sure how God might be speaking to you this morning. But whatever He's saying, let's listen. Let's listen. God can guide even through the darkest of situations. He can. Would you stand?